by arrangement with Monica Ariel Mile, trustee Ethel B. Durant Trust, Monica Ariel Mile, and William James Durant Easton, and was produced in 1995 by Books on Tape Incorporated, which holds the copyright there too. Neither this recording nor any part thereof may be reproduced or used for any purpose without prior written authority from Books on Tape Incorporated. This book is read by Alexander Adams. Book Four, The Roman Renaissance, 1378-1521. Chapter 14, The Crisis in the Church, 1378-1447. 1. The Papal Schism, 1378-1417. Gregory XI had brought the papacy back to Rome, but would it stay there? The conclave that meant to name his successor was composed of sixteen cardinals, only four of whom were Italians. The principal authorities petitioned them to choose a Roman, or at least an Italian. And to support the suggestion, a crowd of Romans gathered outside the Vatican, threatening to kill all non-Italian cardinals, unless a Roman were made pope. The frightened conclave, by a vote of fifteen to one, hastily elected in 1378 Bartolomeo Prignano, Archbishop of Bari, who took the name of Urban VI. Then they fled in fear of their lives but Rome accepted the compromise. Urban VI ruled the city and the church with impetuous and despotic energy. He appointed senators and municipal magistrates and reduced the turbulent capital to obedience and order. He shocked the cardinals by announcing that he proposed to reform the church and to begin at the top. Two weeks later, preaching publicly in their presence, he condemned the morals of the cardinals and the higher clergy in unmeasured terms. He forbade them to accept pensions and ordered that all business brought to the curia should be dispatched without fees or gifts of any kind. When the cardinals murmured, he commanded them to cease your foolish chattering. When Cardinal Orsini protested, the Pope called him a blockhead. When the Cardinal of Limoges objected, Urban rushed at him to strike him. Hearing of all this, St. Catherine sent the fiery pontiff a warning. Do what you have to do with moderation, with good will and a peaceful heart for excess destroys rather than builds up. For the sake of the crucified Lord, keep these hasty movements of your nature a little in check. Urban, heedless, announced his intention to appoint enough Italian cardinals to give Italy a majority in the college. The French cardinals gathered in Anagni and planned a revolt. On August 9, 1378, they issued a manifesto declaring Urban's election invalid as having been made under duress of the Roman mob. All the Italian cardinals joined them, and at Fondi on September 20th, the entire college proclaimed Robert of Geneva to be the true pope. Robert, as Clement VII, took up his residence at Avignon, while Urban clung to his pontifical office in Rome. The papal schism so inaugurated was one more result of the rising national state. In effect, it was an attempt by France to retain the vital aid of the papacy in her war with England and in any future contest with Germany or Italy. The lead of France was followed by Naples, Spain, and Scotland. But England, Flanders, Germany, Poland, Bohemia, Hungary, and Portugal accepted Urban, and the church became the political plaything of the rival camps. The confusion reached a pitch that aroused the scornful laughter of expanding Islam. Half the Christian world held the other half to be heretical, blasphemous, and excommunicate. St. Catherine denounced Clement VII as a Judas, St. Vincent Ferrer applied the same term to Urban VI. Each side claimed that sacraments administered by priests of the opposite obedience were invalid, and that the children so baptized, the penitents so shriven, the dying so anointed, remained in a state of mortal sin, doomed to hell or limbo if death should supervene. Mutual hatred rose to a fervor equaled only in the bitterest wars. When many of Urban's newly appointed cardinals— plotted to place him in confinement as a dangerous incompetent, he had seven of them arrested, tortured, and put to death in 1385. His own death in 1389 brought no compromise. The fourteen cardinals, surviving in his camp, made Piero Tomacelli Pope Boniface IX, and the divided nations prolonged the divided papacy. When Clement VII died in 1394, the cardinals at Avignon named Pedro de Luna to be Benedict the Thirteenth. 
Charles VI of France proposed that both popes should resign. Benedict refused. In 1399, Boniface IX proclaimed a jubilee for the following year. Realizing that many potential pilgrims would be kept at home by the chaos and insecurity of the times, he empowered his agents to give the full indulgence of the jubilee to any Christian who, having confessed his sins and done due penance, should contribute to the Roman church the sum that a trip to Rome would have cost him. The collectors were not scrupulous theologians. Many of them offered the indulgence without requiring confession. Boniface reproved them, but he felt that no one could make better use than he of money so secured. Even amid the acute pains of the stone, said his secretary, Boniface did not cease to thirst for gold. When some collectors tried to cheat him, he had them tortured till they disgorged. Other collectors were torn to pieces by the Roman mob for letting Christians get the jubilee indulgence without coming to spend money in Rome. Amid the jubilee celebrations and solemnities, the Colonna family aroused the people to demand the restoration of republican government. When Boniface refused, the Colonna led an army of 8,000 against him. The aging pope stood siege resolutely in Sant'Angelo. The people turned against the Colonna, the rebel army dispersed, and 31 leaders of the revolt were jailed. One of them was promised his life if he would serve as executioner of the rest. He consented and hanged thirty men, including his father and his brother. On the death of Boniface and the election of Innocent VII in 1404, revolt broke out again, and Innocent fled to Viterbo. The Roman mob, led by Giovanni Colonna, sacked the Vatican, smeared the emblems of Innocent with mud, and scattered papal registers and historic bulls through the streets. This in 1405. Then the people, bethinking themselves that Rome without the popes would be ruined, made their peace with Innocent, who returned in triumph and, a few days later, died in 1406. His successor, Gregory XII, invited Benedict XIII to a conference. Benedict offered to resign if Gregory would do likewise. Gregory's relatives dissuaded him from consent. Some of his cardinals withdrew to Pisa and called for a general council to elect a pope acceptable to all Christendom. The king of France again urged Benedict to resign. When Benedict again refused, France renounced its allegiance and adopted an attitude of neutrality. Deserted by his cardinals, Benedict fled to Spain. His cardinals joined with those who had left Gregory, and together they issued a call for a council to be held at Pisa on March 25, 1409. 2. The Councils and the Popes, 1409-1418 Rebellious philosophers almost a century before had laid the foundations of the conciliar movement. William of Ockham protested against identifying the church with the clergy. The church, he said, is the congregation of all the faithful. That whole has authority superior to any part. It may delegate its authority to a general council, which should have the power to elect, reprove, punish, or depose the pope. A general council, said Marsilius of Padua, is the gathered intelligence of Christendom. How shall any one man dare set up his own intelligence above it? Such a council should be composed not only of clergy, but also of laymen elected by the people, and its deliberations should be free from domination by the Pope. Heinrich von Langenstein, a German theologian at the University of Paris, in a tract, Concilium Pacis, in 1381, applied these ideas to the papal schism. Whatever logic there might be, said Heinrich, in the arguments of the popes for their supreme God-derived authority, a crisis had arisen from which logic offered no escape. Only a power outside the popes and superior to the cardinals could rescue the church from the chaos that was crippling her. And that authority could only be a general council. Jean Gerson, chancellor of the University of Paris, in a sermon preached at Tarascon before Benedict XIII himself, reasoned that since the exclusive power of the Pope to call a general council had failed to end the schism, that rule must be abrogated for the emergency, and a general council must be otherwise summoned and must assume the authority to end the crisis. The Council of Pisa met as scheduled. In the majestic cathedral gathered twenty-six cardinals, four patriarchs, twelve archbishops, eighty bishops, eighty-seven abbots, the generals of all the great monastic orders, delegates from all major universities, 300 doctors of canon law, ambassadors from all the governments of Europe except those of Hungary, Naples, Spain, Scandinavia, and Scotland. The council declared itself canonical, 
valid in church law, and ecumenical, representing the whole Christian world, a claim which ignored the Greek and Russian Orthodox Church. It summoned Benedict and Gregory to appear before it. Neither appearing, it declared them deposed and named the Cardinal of Milan as Pope Alexander V in 1409. It instructed the new pope to call another general council before May 1412 and adjourned. It had hoped to end the schism, but as both Benedict and Gregory refused to recognize its authority, the result was that there were now three popes instead of two. Alexander V did not help matters by dying in 1410. His cardinals chose as his successor John XXIII, the most unmanageable man to occupy the papal throne since his predecessor of that name. Baldassare Cosa had been made papal vicar of Bologna by Boniface IX. He had governed the city like a condottieri, with absolute and unscrupulous power. He had taxed everything, including prostitution, gambling, and usury. According to his secretary, he had seduced two hundred virgins, matrons, widows, and nuns. But he was a man of precious ability in politics and war. He had accumulated great wealth and commanded a force of troops personally loyal to him. Perhaps he could conquer the papal states for Gregory and reduce Gregory to impecunious submission. John the Twenty-Third delayed as long as he could to call the council decreed at Pisa. But in 1411 Sigismund became head of the Romans, and the uncrowned but generally acknowledged head of the Holy Roman Empire. He compelled John to call a council, and chose Constance for its seat as free from Italian intimidation and open to imperial influence. Taking the initiative from the church like another Constantine, Sigismund invited all prelates, princes, lords, and doctors in Christendom to attend. Everybody in Europe responded except the three popes and their retinues. So many dignitaries came at their own dignified leisure that half a year was spent in assembling them. When finally John the Twenty-Third consented to open the council on November 5, 1414, only a fraction had arrived of the three patriarchs, twenty-nine cardinals, thirty-three archbishops, one hundred and fifty bishops, one hundred abbots, three hundred doctors of theology, fourteen thousand deputies, twenty-six princes, one hundred and forty nobles, and four thousand priests who were to make the completed council the largest in Christian history and the most important since the Council of Nicaea in 325 had established the creed of the Church. Where normally Constance had sheltered some 6,000 inhabitants, it now successfully housed and fed not only some 5,000 delegates to the council, but to attend to their wants a host of servants, secretaries, peddlers, physicians, quacks, minstrels, and 1,500 prostitutes. The council had hardly formulated its procedure when it was faced with the dramatic desertion of the pope who had convened it. John the Twenty-Third was shocked to learn that his enemies were preparing to present to the assembly a record of his life, crimes, and incontinence. A committee advised him that this ignominy could be averted if he would agree to join Gregory and Benedict in a simultaneous abdication. He agreed, but suddenly he fled from Constance disguised as a groom on March 20, 1415, and found refuge in a castle at Schaffhausen with Frederick, Archduke of Austria, and foe to Sigismund. On March the 29th, he announced that all the promises made by him in Constance had been drawn from him through fear of violence and could have no binding force. On April 6th, the council issued a decree, Sacra Sancta, which one historian has called the most revolutionary official document in the history of the world. This holy synod of Constance, being a general council and legally assembled in the Holy Spirit for the praise of God and for ending the present schism, and for the union and reform of the Church of God in its head and its members, ordains, declares, and decrees as follows. First, it declares that this synod represents the Church militant and has its authority directly from Christ, and everybody of whatever rank or dignity, including also the Pope, is bound to obey this council in those things that pertain to the faith, to the ending of this schism, and to a general reform of the Church in its head and members. Likewise, it declares that if anyone, of whatever rank, condition, or dignity, including also the Pope, shall refuse to obey the commands, statutes, ordinances, or orders of this holy council, or of any other holy council properly assembled, in regard to the ending of the schism or to the reform of the Church, he shall be subject to proper punishment, and, if necessary, recourse shall be had to other aids of justice. Many cardinals protested against this decree, fearing that it would end the power of the College of Cardinals to elect the Pope. 
The Council overrode their opposition, and thereafter they played but a minor role in its activities. The Council now sent a committee to John the Twenty-Third to ask for his abdication. Receiving no definite answer, it accepted, on May 25th, the presentation of fifty-four charges against him as a pagan, an oppressor, a liar, a simoniac, a traitor, a lecher, and a thief. Sixteen other accusations were suppressed as too severe. On May 29th, the Council deposed John the Twenty-Third, and broken at last, he accepted the decree. Sigismund ordered him confined in the castle of Heidelberg for the duration of the council. He was released in 1418, and found asylum and sustenance as an old man with Cosimo de' Medici. The council celebrated its triumph with a parade through Constance. When it returned to business, it found itself in a quandary. If it should choose another pope, it would be restoring the threefold division of Christendom for many districts still obeyed Benedict or Gregory. Gregory rescued the council by an act at once subtle and magnanimous. He agreed to resign, but only on condition that he should be allowed to reconvene and legitimate the council by his own papal authority. On July 4th, 1415, the council, so reconvened, accepted Gregory's resignation, confirmed the validity of his appointments, and named him legate governor of Ancona, where he lived quietly the two remaining years of his life. Benedict continued to resist, but his cardinals left him and made their peace with the council. On January 26, 1417, the council deposed him. He retired to his family stronghold near Valencia and died there at ninety, still counting himself pope. In October, the council passed a decree, frequence, requiring that another general council should be convened within five years. On November 17th, an electoral committee of the council chose Cardinal Odone Colonna, as Pope Martin V. All Christendom accepted him, and after thirty-nine years of chaos, the Great Schism came to an end. The Council had now accomplished its first purpose, but its victory on this point defeated its other purpose, to reform the Church. When Martin V found himself Pope, he assumed all the powers and prerogatives of the papacy. He displaced Sigismund as President of the Council, and with courteous and subtle address negotiated with each national group in the council a separate treaty of ecclesiastical reform. By playing off each group against the others, he persuaded each to accept a minimum of reform, couched in carefully obscure language which each party might interpret to save its emoluments and its face. The council yielded to him because it was tired. It had labored for three years, it longed for home, and felt that a later synod could take up in sharper detail the problem of reform. On April 22, 1418, it declared itself dissolved. 3. The Triumph of the Papacy, 1418-1447 Martin V, though himself a Roman, could not go at once to Rome. The roads were held by the condottiere Braccio de Montone. Martin thought it safer to stay in Geneva, then Mantua, then Florence. When at last he reached Rome in 1420, he was shocked by the condition of the city, by the dilapidation of the buildings and the people. The capital of Christendom was one of the least civilized cities in Europe. If Martin continued a characteristic abuse by appointing his Colonna relatives to places of income and power, it may be because he had to strengthen his family in order to have some physical security in the Vatican. He had no army, but upon the papal states from every side pressed the armed forces of Naples, Florence, Venice, and Milan. The papal states, for the most part, had again fallen into the hands of petty dictators who, though they called themselves vicars of the Pope, had assumed practically sovereign powers during the division of the papacy. In Lombardy, the clergy had for centuries been hostile to the bishops of Rome. Beyond the Alps lay a disordered Christendom that had lost most of its respect for the papacy and grudged it financial support. Martin faced these difficulties with courage and success. Although he had inherited an almost empty treasury, he allotted funds for the partial rebuilding of his capital. His energetic measures drove the brigands from the roads and Rome. He destroyed a robber stronghold at Montelipo and had its leaders beheaded. He restored order in Rome and codified its communal law. He appointed one of the early humanists, Poggio Bracciolini, to be a papal secretary. He engaged Gentile da Fabriano, Antonio Pisanello, and Masaccio to paint frescoes in Santa Maria Maggiore and St. John in the Lateran. He named men of intellect and character, like Giuliano Cesarini, Louis Alamon, 
Domenico Capranica, and Prospero Colonna to the College of Cardinals. He reorganized the Curia to effective functioning, but found no way to finance it except by selling offices and services. Since the Church had survived for a century without reform, but could hardly survive a week without money, Martin judged money to be more urgently needed than reform. Pursuant to the Frequent's decree of Constance, he called a council to meet at Pavia in 1423. It was sparsely attended. Plague compelled its transference to Siena. When it proposed to assume absolute authority, Martin ordered it to dissolve, and the bishops, fearing for their sees, obeyed. To soothe the spirit of reform, Martin issued in 1425 a bull detailing some admirable changes in the procedure and financing of the curia. But a thousand obstacles and objections arose, and the proposals faded in the quick oblivion of time. In 1430, a German envoy to Rome sent to his prince a letter that almost sounded the tocsin of the Reformation. Greed reigns supreme in the Roman court, and day by day finds new devices for extorting money from Germany under pretext of ecclesiastical fees. Hence much outcry and heartburnings. Also many questions in regard to the papacy will arise, or else obedience will at last be entirely renounced to escape from these outrageous exactions of the Italians. And this latter course, as I perceive, will be acceptable to many countries. Martin's successor faced the accumulated problems of the papacy from the background of a devout Franciscan monk ill-equipped for statesmanship. The papacy was a government more than a religion. The popes had to be statesmen, sometimes warriors, and could rarely afford to be saints. Eugenius IV was sometimes a saint. True, he was obstinate and doerly inflexible, and the gout that gave him almost constant pain in his hands helped his sea of troubles to make him impatient and unsociable. But he lived ascetically, ate sparingly, drank nothing but water, slept little, worked hard, attended conscientiously to his religious duties, bore no malice against his enemies, pardoned readily, gave generously, kept nothing for himself, and was so modest that in public he seldom raised his eyes from the ground. Yet few popes have earned so many foes. The first were the cardinals who had elected him. As the price of their votes, and to protect themselves from such one-man rule as that of Martin, they had induced him to sign capitula, literally headings, promising them freedom of speech, guarantees for their offices, control over half the revenues, and consultation with them on all important affairs. Such capitulations set a precedent regularly followed in papal elections throughout the Renaissance. Furthermore, Eugenius made powerful enemies of the Colonna. Believing that Martin had transferred too much church property to that family, he ordered restoration of many parcels, and had Martin's former secretary tortured almost to death to elicit information in the matter. The Colonna made war upon the Pope. He defeated them with soldiery sent him by Florence and Venice, but in the process he aroused the hostility of Rome. Meanwhile, the Council of Basel, called by Martin, met in the first year, 1431, of the new pontificate, and proposed again to assert the supremacy of the councils over the popes. Eugenius ordered it to dissolve. It refused, commanded him to appear before it, and sent Milanese troops to attack him in Rome. The Colonna seized the chance for revenge. They organized a revolution in the city, and set up a republican government, this in 1434. Eugenius fled down the Tiber in a small boat pelted by the populace with arrows, pikes, and stones. He found refuge in Florence, then in Bologna. For nine years he and the Curia were exiles from Rome. The majority of the delegates to the Council of Basel were French. They aimed, as the Bishop of Tours frankly said, either to wrestle the Apostolic See from the Italians, or so to despoil it that it will not matter where it abides. The council therefore assumed one after another the prerogatives of the papacy. It issued indulgences, granted dispensations, appointed to benefices, and required that annats should be paid to itself and not to the pope. Eugenius again ordered its dissolution. It countered by deposing him in 1439, and naming Amadeus VIII of Savoy as anti-pope Felix V. The schism was renewed. To complete the apparent defeat of Eugenius, Charles VII of France convened at Bourges in 1438 an assembly of French prelates, princes, and lawyers, which proclaimed the supremacy of councils over popes and issued the pragmatic sanction of Bourges. Ecclesiastical offices were henceforth to be filled through election by the local chapter or clergy, but the king might make recommendations. 
Appeals to the papal curia were forbidden except after exhausting all judicial possibilities in France. The collection of annats by the Pope was prohibited. This sanction in effect established an independent Gallican church and made the king its master. A year later, a diet at Mainz adopted measures for a similar national church in Germany. The Bohemian church had separated itself from the papacy in the Hussite revolt. The Archbishop of Prague called the Pope the Beast of the Apocalypse. The whole edifice of the Roman Church seemed shattered beyond repair. The nationalistic reformation seemed established a century before Luther. Eugenius was rescued by the Turks. As the Ottomans came ever nearer to Constantinople, the Byzantines decided that Constantinople was worth a Roman mass and that a reunion of Greek with Roman Christianity was an indispensable prelude to securing military aid from the West. The Emperor John VIII sent an embassy to Martin V in 1431 to propose a council of both churches. The Council of Basel dispatched envoys to John in 1433, explaining that the council was superior in power to the Pope, was under the protection of the Emperor Sigismund, and would procure money and troops for the defense of Constantinople if the Greek church would deal with the council rather than with the Pope. Eugenius sent his own embassy, offering aid on condition that the proposal of union should be laid before a new council to be called by him at Ferrara. John decided for Eugenius. The Pope summoned to Ferrara such of the hierarchy as were still loyal to him. Many leading prelates, including Cesarini and Nicholas of Cusa, abandoned Basel for Ferrara, feeling that the matter of prime importance was the negotiation with the Greeks. The council at Basel lingered on, but with mounting exasperation— and declining prestige. The news that Christendom, divided between the Greek and the Roman churches since 1054, was now to be united, stirred all Europe. On February 8, 1438, the Byzantine emperor, the patriarch Joseph of Constantinople, seventeen Greek metropolitans and a large number of Greek bishops, monks, and scholars, arrived at Venice, still partly a Byzantine city. At Ferrara, Eugenius received them with a pomp that must have meant little to the ceremonious Greeks. After the opening of the council, various commissions were appointed to reconcile the divergences of the two churches on the primacy of the Pope, the use of unleavened bread, the nature of the pains of purgatory, and the procession of the Holy Ghost from the Father and or the Son. For eight months, the pundits argued these points but could come to no agreement. Meanwhile, plague broke out in Ferrara. Cosimo de' Medici invited the council to move to Florence and be housed at the expense of himself and his friends. It was so ordered, and some would date the Italian Renaissance from that influx of learned Greeks into Florence in 1439. There it was agreed that the formula acceptable to the Greeks, that the Holy Ghost proceeds from the Father through the Son, ex patre per filium procedit, meant the same as the Roman formula, proceeds from the Father and the Son ex patre filioque procedit, and by June 1439 an accord was reached on purgatorial pains. The primacy of the Pope led to hot debates, and the Greek emperor threatened to break up the council. The conciliatory archbishop Bessarion of Nicaea contrived a promise that recognized the universal authority of the Pope, but reserved all the existing rights and privileges of the Eastern churches. The formula was accepted, and on July 6th, 1439, in the great cathedral that only three years before had received from Brunellesco its majestic dome, the decree uniting the two churches was read in Greek by Bessarion and in Latin by Cesarini. The two prelates kissed, and all the members of the council, with the Greek emperor at their head, bent the knee before that same Eugenius who had seemed so recently the despised and rejected of men. The joy of Christendom was brief. When the Greek emperor and his suite returned to Constantinople, they were met with insults and ribaldry. The clergy and population of the city repudiated the submission to Rome. Eugenius kept his part of the bargain. Cardinal Cesarini was sent to Hungary at the head of an army to join the forces of Ladislas and Hunyadi. They were victorious at Nish, entered Sofia in triumph on Christmas Eve of 1443, and were routed at Varna by Murad II in 1444. The anti-Union party in Constantinople won the upper hand, and the patriarch Gregory, who had supported Union, fled to Italy. Gregory fought his way back to St. Sophia and read the decree of Union there in 1452. But from that time the great church was shunned by the people. The anti-Union clergy anathematized all adherents of Union, 
refused absolution to those who had attended the reading of the decree, and exhorted the sick to die without the sacraments rather than receive them from an uniate priest. The patriarchs of Alexandria, Antioch, and Jerusalem repudiated the robber synod of Florence. Mohammed II simplified the situation by making Constantinople a Turkish capital in 1453. He gave the Christians full freedom of worship and appointed as patriarch Gennadius, a devoted foe of unity. Eugenius returned to Rome in 1443 after his legate general, Cardinal Vitileschi, had suppressed the chaotic republic and the turbulent Colonna with a ferocity unequaled by the Vandals or the Goths. The Pope's stay at Florence had acquainted him with the developments of humanism and art under Cosimo de' Medici, and the Greek scholars who had attended the Council of Ferrara and Florence had aroused in him an interest in the preservation of the classic manuscripts that the imminent fall of Constantinople might forfeit or destroy. He added to his secretariat Poggio, Flavio Biondo, Leonardo Bruni, and other humanists who could negotiate with the Greeks in Greek. He brought Fra Angelico to Rome and had him paint frescoes in the chapel of the sacrament at the Vatican. Having admired the bronze gates that Ghiberti had cast for the Florentine baptistry, Eugenius commissioned Filarete to make similar doors for the old church of St. Peter in 1433. It was significant, though already it aroused hardly any comment, that the sculptor placed upon the portals of the chief church in Latin Christendom not only Christ and Mary and the Apostles, but Mars and Roma, Hero and Leander, Jupiter and Ganymede, even Leda and the Swan. In the hour of his victory over the Council of Basel, Eugenius brought the pagan Renaissance to Rome. Chapter 15. The Renaissance Captures Rome, 1447-1492. 1. The Capital of the World. When Pope Nicholas V mounted the oldest throne in the world, Rome was hardly a tenth of the Rome that had been enclosed by the walls of Aurelian, A.D. 270-275, and was smaller in area and population, 80,000, than Venice, Florence, or Milan. Since the ruin of the major aqueducts by the barbarian invasions, the Seven Hills had been without a reliable water supply. Some minor aqueducts remained, some springs, many cisterns and wells, but a large proportion of the inhabitants drank the water of the Tiber. Most of the people lived in the unhealthy plains, subject to inundation from the river and to malarial infection from the neighboring swamps. The Capitoline Hill was now called Monte Caprino, from the goats, or Capri, that nibbled its slopes. The Palatine Hill was a rural retreat, almost uninhabited. The ancient palaces from which it derived its name were dusty quarries, the Borgo Vaticano, or Vatican Town, was a small suburb across the river from the central city and huddled about the decaying shrine of St. Peter. Some churches, like Santa Maria Maggiore or Santa Cecilia, were beautiful within but plain without, and no church in Rome could compare with the Duomo of Florence or Milan. No monastery could rival the Certosa di Pavia. No town hall rose to the dignity of the Palazzo Vecchio or the Castello Sforzesco, or the Palace of the Doges, or even the Palazzo Publico of Siena. Nearly all the streets were muddy or dusty alleys. Some were paved with cobblestones. Only a few were lit at night. They were swept only on extraordinary occasions like a jubilee or the formal entry of some very important person. The economic support of the city came partly from pasturage and the production of wool and the cattle that grazed in the environing fields, but chiefly from the revenues of the church. There was little agriculture and only petty trade. Industry and commerce had well-nigh disappeared through lack of protection from brigand raids. There was almost no middle class, only nobles, ecclesiastics, and commoners. The nobles, who owned nearly all the land that had not fallen to the church, exploited their peasantry without Christian compunction or hindrance. They suppressed revolt and waged their feuds with bravi, Strong-armed ruffians kept in their employ and trained to beat or kill. The great families, above all the Colonna and the Orsini, seized tombs, baths, theaters, and other structures in or near Rome and turned them into private fortresses, and their rural castles were designed for war. The nobles were usually hostile to the popes or strove to name and govern them. Time and again they created such disorder that the popes fled. Pius II prayed that any other city might be his capital. When Sixtus IV and Alexander VI warred against such men, 
it was in a forgivable effort to win some security for the papal see. Normally, the ecclesiastics ruled Rome, for they had the church's varied revenue to spend. The inhabitants were dependent upon that influx of gold from a dozen countries, upon the employment it enabled churchmen to provide, and upon the charity that it allowed the popes to dispense. The people of Rome could not be enthusiastic about any reform of the church that would lessen that golden flow. Precluded from rebellion, they substituted for it a sharpness of satire unequaled elsewhere in Europe. A statue in the Piazza Navona, probably a Hellenistic Hercules, was renamed Paschino, perhaps from a nearby tailor, and became the bulletin board of the latest squibs, usually in the form of Latin or Italian epigrams, and often against the reigning pope. The Romans were religious, at least on occasion. They crowded to receive the papal blessing, and were proud to imitate ambassadors by kissing the papal feet. But when Sixtus IV, suffering from gout, failed to appear for a scheduled benediction, they cursed him with Roman virulence. Moreover, since Eugenius IV had abrogated the Roman Republic, the popes were the secular rulers of Rome, and received the contumely usually awarded to governments. It was the misfortune of the papacy to be seated amid the most lawless population in Italy. The popes felt themselves thoroughly justified in claiming a degree and area of temporal power. As the heads of an international organization, they could not afford to be the captives of any one state, as they had been in effect in Avignon. So trammeled, they could hardly serve all peoples impartially, much less realize their majestic dream of being the spiritual governors of every government. Though the donation of Constantine was a palpable forgery, as Nicholas admitted by hiring Vala, the donation of central Italy to the papacy by Pepin in 755, confirmed by Charlemagne in 773, was an historical fact. The popes had coined their own money at least as far back as 782, and for centuries no one had questioned their right. The unification of local powers, feudal or martial, in a central government was taking place in the papal states as in the other nations of Europe. If the popes from Nicholas V to Clement VII ruled their states as absolute monarchs, they were following the fashion of the times, and they could with reason complain when reformers like Chancellor Gerson of the University of Paris proposed democracy in the church, but deprecated it in the state. Neither state nor church was ready for democracy at a time when printing had not yet begun or spread. Nicholas V became pope seven years before Gutenberg printed his Bible, thirty years before printing reached Rome, forty-eight years before the first publication of Aldus Minucius. Democracy is a luxury of disseminated intelligence, security, and peace. The secular rule of the popes directly applied to what antiquity had called Latium, now Lazio, a small province lying between Tuscany, Umbria, the Kingdom of Naples, and the Tyrrhenian Sea. Beyond this, they claimed also Umbria, the Marches, and the Romagna, the ancient Romania. These four regions together made a broad belt across central Italy from sea to sea. They contained some twenty-six cities, which the popes, when they could, ruled by vicars, or divided among provincial governors. Furthermore, Sicily and the whole kingdom of Naples were claimed as papal fiefs on the basis of an agreement between Pope Innocent III and Frederick II, and the payment of an annual feudal fee by these states to the papacy became a major source of quarrels between the Regno and the popes. Finally, the Countess Matilda had bequeathed to the popes in 1107 as her feudal domain practically all of Tuscany, including Florence, Lucca, Pistoia, Pisa, Siena, and Arezzo. Over all these, the popes claimed the rights of a feudal sovereign, but rarely were able to give effect to their claim. Harassed by internal corruption, military and fiscal incompetence, and the confusion of European with Italian politics, and of ecclesiastical with secular affairs, the papacy struggled through centuries to preserve its traditional territories from internal usurpation by condottieri and from external encroachment by other Italian states. So Milan repeatedly tried to appropriate Bologna, Venice seized Ravenna and sought to absorb Ferrara, and Naples stretched tentative tentacles into Latium. To meet these attacks, the popes seldom depended on their little army of mercenaries, but played the covetous states one against another in a balance of power policy, striving to keep any one of them from growing strong enough to swallow papal terrain. 
Machiavelli and Guicciardini rightly traced the disunion of Italy in part to this policy of the popes. And the popes rightly pursued it as their only means of sustaining their political and spiritual independence through their temporal power. As political rulers, the popes felt compelled to adopt the same methods as their secular compeers. They distributed, sometimes they sold, offices or benefices to influential persons, even to minors, to pay political debts, or to advance political purposes, or to reward or support men of letters or artists. They arranged marriages for their relatives into politically powerful families. They used armies like Julius II, or the diplomacy of deceit like Leo X. They put up with, sometimes profited from, a degree of bureaucratic venality probably no greater than that which prevailed in most governments of the time. The laws of the papal states were as severe as those of others. Thieves and counterfeiters were hanged by papal vicars as a more or less bitter necessity of government. Most of the popes lived as simply as the supposedly requisite display of official ceremony would permit. The worst tales we read of them were legends set afloat by irresponsible satirists like Berni, or disappointed place hunters like Aretino, or the Roman agents, for example, in Fesura, of powers in violent or diplomatic conflict with the papacy. As for the cardinals who administered the ecclesiastical and political affairs of the church, they thought of themselves as senators of a wealthy state, and lived accordingly. Many of them built palaces, many patronized letters or arts, some indulged themselves with mistresses. They genially accepted the easy moral code of their reckless time. As a spiritual power, the Renaissance popes faced the problem of reconciling humanism with Christianity. Humanism was half pagan, and the Church had once set herself to destroy paganism root and branch, creed and art. She had encouraged or countenanced the demolition of pagan temples and statuary. The Cathedral of Orvieto, for example, had only recently been built with marbles taken partly from Carrara, partly from Roman ruins. A papal legate had sold marble blocks from the Colosseum to be burned for lime. As late as 1461, the Palazzo Venezia had been begun with further spoliation of that Flavian amphitheater. Nicholas himself, in his architectural enthusiasm, used 2,500 cartloads of marble and travertine from the Colosseum, the Circus Maximus, and other ancient structures to rebuild the churches and palaces of Rome. To reverse that attitude, to preserve and collect and cherish the remaining art and classics of Rome and Greece, required a revolution in ecclesiastical thought. The prestige of humanism was already so high, the impetus of the neo-pagan movement was so strong, her own leaders were so deeply tinged with it, that the Church had to find place for these developments in the Christian life, or risk losing the intellectual classes of Italy, perhaps later of Europe. Under Nicholas V, she opened her arms to humanism, placed herself bravely and generously on the side, at the head, of the new literature and art. And for an exhilarating century, from 1447 to 1534, she gave to the mind of Italy such ample freedom, incredibilis libertas, said Filelfo, and to the art of Italy such discriminating patronage, opportunity, and stimulus, that Rome became the center of the Renaissance and enjoyed one of the most brilliant epochs in the history of mankind. 2. Nicholas V, 1447-1455 Raised in poverty at Sarzana, Tommaso Parentucelli somehow found means to attend the University of Bologna for six years. This book is continued at this point on the other side of this cassette. Please reverse or turn the cassette over now.